So thank you for coming back this afternoon. Um, the next talk will be from Saria McLeadin, Saria McKeithen Mead, and she will be talking about mistimed integration of an integrative and conjugative element leads to death in naive bacterial hosts. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here today to tell you about my research, which focuses on the how bacteria acquire new genetic information. So this occurs through a process known as horizontal gene transfer, which is the primary driver of prokaryotic evolution. Now, it plays a very important role in that it increases genomic plasticity and genetic diversity in microbial populations. In fact, for some bacteria, approximately 50% of the genes encoded on their genome have been acquired horizontally. Okay? And now this has very important implications for human health as it drives the acquisition of new traits such as pathogenic determinants, antibiotic resistance, and alternative carbon metabolism. Now, there are a few mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer used by bacteria. I study one type, which is conjugation. And that is a contact-dependent transfer of DNA through a specialized secretion system and into recipient cell. Now, there are two primary, uh, two main classes of conjugative elements. There's the more widely known and well-studied conjugative plasmids, think F plasmid and E. coli. And there's the lesser known, but they're actually far more prevalent as they're found in virtually every prokaryotic clade, known as conjugative transposons. Now, conjugative transposons are also known as integrative and conjugative elements, or ices for short. And a clear delineation between plasmids and ices are that ices reside integrated into the chromosome of their host, and thus are passively propagated as the cell replicates and segregates its chromosome. Now, when activated, the element excises from the chromosome and exists as an ice plasmid. In this state, it's transfer competent as it expresses those genes required for replication along with mating. Now, ice DNA transfers as linear, single-stranded DNA through the conjugation machinery and into recipient. A recipient undergoes phenotypic conversion into a transconjugant when that linear, single-stranded ice DNA is reconstituted as ice plasmid, which is suitable substrate for integration of the element into the chromosome of its host. This usually occurs via site-specific recombination, and stable acquisition occurs when the element integrates into the chromosome of its host. Now, when I joined the lab, what I really wanted to focus on was events in transconjugants. This is something that had not been done in the field up until that point, and so I wanted to answer some very basic questions, such as how long does it take from the initiation of conjugation for integration to occur? What are the sequence of events that the element must go through in order for this to occur? How does regulation impact that procession? And what aspects of the element life cycle are actually absolutely critical for acquisition? So summary for today's talk is I'll tell you about some of my work looking at events in transconjugants. And I'll show you that the timing of integration is critically important and that premature integration is lethal. And just kind of as a preview of things to come, this is what happens when I recapitulate premature integration in cells. You'll see that they die in this very dramatic fashion. Okay. Now, the bread and butter of any lab studying conjugation is a mating assay. It's a very simple assay. We simply mix donors with the activated element with recipients and identify transconjugants by their antibiotic resistance. Okay. Now, I've told you that I was interested in measuring integration. So an additional component that I added to this assay was qPCR. So the element I work with, ICBS-1, found in Bacillus subtilis, lends itself very well to this because it integrates via site-specific recombination into a single site on the chromosome of its host. Okay. So combining conjugation and qPCR, um, <clears throat> I can measure what fraction of the transconjugants the element has integrated at the time that I stop a mating. And so you'll take, see that it takes about three hours for the majority of transconjugants to have an integrated element, okay? And so at three hours, we're at about 65%. You'll notice that I don't have the one hour time point plotted on here, and that's because I never measure integration at that time, okay? We know that transconjugants are produced because they'll appear, we'll have CFUs on the plate, but I never, using qPCR, am able to detect integration. And that doesn't occur until about two hours, and it's only in 5% of the population. So what, is responsible for kind of this delay in integration from the initiation of conjugation. Well, that has to do with how the element is regulated. So there are two genes that are necessary and sufficient for integration and excision of ICBS1. There's the integrase int, 
which is required for both integration and excision, and the excision ASIC size, which is a recombination directionality factor, which if present, uh, directs the recombination equilibrium such that excision is favored. Now we know that in the transconjugates, both the integrase and the excision ACE are expressed. And in order for there to be integration, there needs to re be repression of excised gene expression and eventual dilution of the excised protein, so that with just the integrase present, the element integrates. So based on this, I made a very simple prediction. If I delete the excision ACE, I bypass the need for repression of gene expression and dilution of the protein, and thus now integration is dependent on just expression of the integrase. So how do we measure that? Well, again, go back to my mating assay. I made a simple deletion of the excisionase on the element. I provide a copy in trans so the element can excise from the donor chromosome and transfer to recipient cells. And then I can observe the behavior of the mutant ice in transconjugates. Okay. So as predicted, this did lead to earlier integration. You can see that very clearly at the two-hour time point, where the delta excised mutant, 45, at the two-hour time point, approximately 45% of the transconjugates I retrieve by CFUs have integrated the element measured by qPCR in the detection of integrated DNA. Uh, strikingly, and kind of unexpectedly, I observed greater than 100% integration at the three hour time point, and this is for an element that's unable to excise. So what this indicates is that some of the transconjugates are dying, okay? So I sought to directly observe this using a fluorescent reporter assay. And so simply, I place the yellow fluorescent protein on ice VS1 so that it's mobile, and any ice-positive cell fluoresces yellow. I made it these with donors that had a red fluorescent protein, and so I can identify transconjugates by the expression of both fluorescent proteins. And so here's an example micrograph where you can see the different cell types. The donors pale yellow, recipients are red, uh, and transconjugates appear either as orange or this very bright yellow. And we think that this bright yellow is actually due to increased copy number of the element in these cells. So on the next slide, what I'm gonna show you is kind of a uh, time lapse on a much larger field where I track the fate of transconjugates where the element is unable to excise, okay? And so you'll notice, again, we have our different cell types, and then I also have white arrows pointing to some of these transconjugates. And what I found is that over a three hour period of time following the stop halting mating, that some fraction of the delta excised transconjugates lice. So you can see here it's 7% compared to less than 0.5% of wild type. So something about this early integration is lethal for these transconjugates, okay? And so I'll just make a note right now that this 7% is likely to be an underestimate because I'm simply just looking at a point in time uh, and not all transconjugates that die are gonna lice, but there's this very easy phenotype to see by eye. So given that, it's much easier to investigate mechanism of action where you're, if your entire population is behaving the same. And so uh, what I did was I simply recapitulated premature integration at donors. And so I, how I achieve this is I delete the excisionase on ice. I don't complement it like I do for mating assay. And so we can actually, in this context, activate the expression of the element in greater than 90% of the cells. And so Activation of an integrated element should mimic integration of an active element, okay? And as you see, these donors, as I showed you before, they are lysing similar to those transconjugants, and it's the majority of the population. Now using this, I could do a simple viability assay, uh, and I think you can appreciate here that there is clearly loss of viability for the delta excised mutant. So a locked-in ice that's activated is lethal for its host, and this is rescued by simply supplying the ability to the element for it to excise, okay? Now, activation of locked-in ice does not explain why this is lethal in and of itself and indicated that there's something else about ice biology that's responsible for this. Well, the reason why it's lethal has to do with how the element replicates. So ice BS1, uh, along with other uh, ices, replicates by rolling circle replication. So under normal conditions, when the element has excised from the chromosome, this isn't a problem. It can replicate autonomously with minimal effects on the host. However, we know for other locked-in mutants of the element, not only is there initiation of replication, but there's actually multiple rounds of replication that initiate within the element and then extend it to the chromosome of their host. And I've independently verified this for this mutant. And so it's actually activation of a locked-in element and replication that is leading to loss of viability because in the delta excised mutant, we also inhibit the ability of the element to replicate 
it rescues viability. Okay. Now, rolling circle replication of an integrated element leads to catastrophic genomic instability, and that's what I'm gonna show you next. Characteristic of this, we see evidence for the activation of the DNA damage repair response. There's double strand breaks that occur, and I also see septum defects. However, the most compelling evidence is to actually observe the chromosomes in these cells as they're segregating. And so here what I'm gonna show you is time-lapse microscopy where I've stained the chromosomes with DAPI. And what you'll see is that for the deltic size mutant, the chromosome fragments, the cells lice soon thereafter, whereas wild type continues to grow, replicate, and segregate its chromosomes fairly normal. And just if you missed it the first time, the deltic size mutant, there's fragmentation, you can see in a couple of these cells, they lice, whereas wild type continues to grow, replicate, and segregate its chromosomes. Okay. Now, what I've shown you is that repression of gene expression is critically important in transcontinents, and it takes about two to three generations for the element to integrate. I can create a scenario of early integration by deleting one gene, the excisionase. However, this leads to integration of an active replicating element, resulting in chromosome instability and eventual cell death. So that's what I've shown you. However, um, I've learned quite a bit from this project, okay? So I found that repression of excise and replication are linked to integration. Regulation of integration is critical for the fitness of transconjugants. If I uncouple regulation from integration, it results in uh, death of the host. And so we think that this coupling is likely to be conserved for other mobile genetic elements that both integrate into the chromosome of their hosts, are capable of autonomous replication, and need their host to remain viable. Okay. Oops. Now this study in and of itself was uh, kind of novel and that it was done from a different perspective, that of transconjugants, it had not been done before. And prior focus had been very donor-centric, right? We make a mutation in the donor, we observe what fraction of the population keeps the element. Or we make a mutation in the donor, we do the mating assay, and we just count the number of transconjugants we retrieve and assume everything else in the middle. And so by kind of doing things from a different viewpoint, uh, we found some evolutionary perspective on rolling circle replication and kind of... Uh, in the regulatory sense, what needs to be in place in order for this to be a successful maintenance and acquisition strategy for these elements. And then as a bonus for the excisionase, it's not only important for excision in donors, but they, it also seems to be acting as a timer for integration in transconjugants. And in the literature, though not looked at in this specific context, there's evidence that these excisionases play a similar role in other ices and other mobile genetic elements. And then finally, for broader implications, um, our lab, as well as some other labs, have been using ICES to, for microbial engineering to essentially make previously genetically intractable bacteria tractable. Um, and so these elements range anywhere from 15 kb to 500 kb in size. They have entire pathogenicity islands or biosynthetic, and cluster, biosynthetic clusters encoded on them. You can essentially remove those or add in whatever cluster of interest and introduce these into different bacteria. And then from a synthetic biology standpoint, mobile genetic elements are very modular in their architecture. So there's a conjugation module, there's a replication module, and you can mix and match the modules from different elements to create these hybrid elements with different, with different properties, such as increased host range or different replication capabilities. And so in order to better engineer microorganisms and to create better genetic tools, it's really important that we understand the ice dynamics and functions that are important for acquisition and maintenance of the element. And so just some brief acknowledgements, I'd like to thank my mentor, members of my lab. This was right after my defense and the first defense in person in a very long time. So there's both a lab alum and current members in there, as well as the MIT Biology Graduate Program and some funding sources. It's a beautiful talk, really, really well structured. I was just wondering in your top fork of your mechanism, what do you think is involved in the repression at the transcriptional level? I'm sorry, the, did you repeat that? Oh, sorry, with the mask, sorry. Uh, what do you think is involved in the repression? What do you think the mechanism of transcriptional repression is at the top of your fork of your Oh mechanism? yeah, so we actually know this. There's a immunity repressor that drives expression of both of these promoters. Uh, and so it kind of, there was some titration to that where there's about six operators, eight operators actually, and it binds with different affinities depending on the level of that repressor. And so we know that in the complete absence of the repressor, there's actually incredibly, it's the strongest promoter I've seen in bacillus. 
essentially that drives expression of this gene. So the expectation is initially transient, very high expression. And since this repressor drives its own expression, right, it's auto, you know, auto regulates, that you'd eventually get repression here and more expression of that integrase. A very interesting talk. I just had a question about the conjugation itself. So yeah. what is the mechanism of that and how species specific is it? Oh, sure, sure. Um, so we know that for this, this particular, oh, I'm gonna go back to the original, ISPS1, um, it transfers very well in firmicutes. Um, there's other elements such as T916, which has a much broader host range. Um, and so Bacillus does very good with gram positive to other gram positive, where TN916 seems to actually be able to go from gram positive to gram negatives. Um, and so with this, you know, we're really behind on gram positives in terms of how that conjugation machinery is built. But we know there's cell wall hydrolases that will chew through the peptidoglycan. And we assume that there's some sort of contact that's made and you need a cell wall hydrolase to remove the peptidoglycan. So this conjugation machinery can make direct contact with the other host, but it's still a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. Yes. That was very exciting. I was struck by your lysis movies. Can you speak more to how that mechanism worked? Sure. Um, so yeah. So Bacillus subtilis encodes autolysins, which are activated when there's loss of the proton motive force and you get all the hydrogen atoms pumped out. And so what I've actually, I don't have it here, but what I've actually done is at much smaller fine time points. Um, lysis is not actually death, they die before that. And so what I actually see happen is at the time that they stain with propidium iodide, they shrink about 25% of their cell volume, and that would indicate that there's loss of the proton motive force. We're likely activating the autolysins, and they're chewing up the peptidoglycan, and the cell's bursting. So, yeah, it's actually they are already present, but they seem to be activated by a change in membrane potential. Yeah, so they're just already hanging out in the peptidoglycan and something about that. I think there's still some work to be done there. And, in that exact mechanism. Yeah. Thank you for the excellent discussion. We'll have to stop here. So our next talk will be from Zer Vu from Vanderbilt, and she will be talking about mouse muscle skeletal something, 3D reconstruction. Thank you. So the title of my talk is 3D reconstruction of the mouse skeletal muscle reveals a decrease in the mucos complex and altered mitochondria networks. I get it, it's a mouthful. So um, from my title, you can, uh, you can see that we're really interested in mitochondria and skeletal muscle and um, aging. So we know that one of the um, biggest hallmarks of aging is uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And in the lab, this is directly what we are interested in. And so in my talk today, I will be talking about um, how mitochondrial dysfunction uh, contributes to aging or vice versa. And so the question that we actually are very interested in the lab is how uh, mitochondrial capacity is altered in aging. And so here you have a very healthy individual. Um, if you were to uh, take a portion of his retina or his skeletal muscle, uh, this is uh, the mitochondria you, that you will see. Um, and this was um, constructed using Fib cell. However, this is a lot of people have only shown this in healthy individuals. This hasn't really been shown in aging. And so what we really wanted to know was how does this look like or what is happening while aging is occurring, right? And so just a little background, what exactly are the mitochondria proteins that are involved in the aging process? And so here we have mitofusion one and two and OPA one that are really important in um, fusion of mitochondria. And um, in fission, you need the presence of DRP1 that separates mitochondria. And so here I have an arrow pointing to OPA one um, to just remind you that uh, I'll be talking a lot about this protein a little bit later. And so if you don't, so I just want you guys to remember that OPA1 is involved in um, fusion. And another, the, another of the proteins are um, the mitochondria cristae proteins. 
And so if you were to make a cross-section of the mitochondria, what you see is that you kind of see these tubular structures in the middle of mitochondria. And then if you, um, so these are called cristae. And if you were to zoom in here at the cristae junction, what you have is that you have these um, mitochondria cristae proteins called the Mikos complex. And so the complex is comprised of about seven proteins. And um, they're there to actually um, help with the shape of the cristae. And it affects the structure of the OSFAL system, which is really important for ATP synthesis. And it's um, and highly involved in the cellular metabolism and growth. And so if you were to knock out the uh, mitochondria um, uh, cristae proteins, the Mikos complex, so in the wild type, what you have is that you have this cristae that has this cristae junction. However, if you were to knock it out, what happens is that you disrupt this cristae shape where they don't have this junction anymore. And so you actually uh, affect the structure of the OSFA system, which uh, again is involved in ATP synthesis, but also it impairs cellular metabolism and growth. And so uh, how is the Mikos complex involved in aging, right? And so we know um, that the Mikos complex actually interacts directly with the OPA1. And so here at the cristae junction, you have OPA1 that's in purple, and then this um, Mikos complex, is, which is in kind of in yellow and um, orange. What happens is that OPA1 and the Mikos complex will actually bind directly to each other so that this cristae will form. And we know that um, when you have loss of OPA1, so here is a loss of OPA1, and what we see is that we lose this um, really pretty cristae morphology. But not just that, we also see that we get loss of the Mikos complex. And so we really want to understand what the Mikos complex is doing and how that influences pathophysiology. And so <clears throat> we really want to understand uh, how this damage to uh, cristae and mitochondria contributes to this pathophysiology so that in the future, one of the main goals that we want to do is actually um, see if we are able to uh, repair the cristae. And so this is just the model of what we're doing. One of the things that we really want to do is that we want to mimic um, human aging. And so for those who don't work in mouse, uh, we're looking at three, three month, one year, and two year mice. And uh, we re um, this is really to mimic um, a, young, um, a young adult in humans for the three months in um, mice. And then the same for one year in, in middle age humans. And then two-year mice is to mimic uh, elderly people. And so we're doing this in the gastrocnemius uh, muscles and black six mice. And these are, uh, and we're doing um, three, the end of three, so three mice and then uh, three regions of interest. And from each region of interest, we do about 250 uh, mitochondria per sample. And so this is really just to create a baseline for normal mitochondria development or just normal mitochondria throughout um, lifehood. And so uh, this is using block facing SEM. What we did is that we uh, took these gastrocnemius muscle and we looked at three month, one year, and two year. And then um, what we did is that we went in and we manually drew in all these mitochondria and we reconstructed it in 3D. And so here you see that in, um, in the 3D, in the three months, we see highly structured um, with lots of connections and networks. And so one color that you see here actually denotes one mitochondria. And we can actually quantify this because we did it, um, we're able to do this in 3D. We do see that there's a general um, decrease from three months to two year in the volume, perimeter, and area. And so we also uh, can look at different parameters to look at shape and form. And so we, um, in the field, we use this um, uh, equation called the mitochondrial branching index. And what we do is that we take the transverse um, um, quantifications and we divide that by the well, longitudinal quantifications of a mitochondria. And then we can look at um, the branching index. And one of the things we see is that we see this general trend where there's less branching and the branching index decreases over time during aging. And here is just to, um, one of the things that we do in the field is we do uh, middle O typing, which is kind of a um, karyotyping of mitochondria. And if you really look at the mitochondria at three months to one year to two year, one of the things that we do see is this general trend where 
they're highly connected, and over time, they become um, more fragmented and smaller. And so if you looked at the sphericity, um, in the one year and two year, they're less spherical compared to the two years because the two years are so small and fragmented. And then one of the things I really want to introduce you guys to is this idea of nanotunnels. So nanotunnels exist because it's a method for mitochondrial communications. And so what happens is that nanotunnels form. There are these thin double membrane projections that connects two non-adjacent mitochondria to each other. The parameters that um, makes up a nanotunnel is that they're usually 40 to uh, 200 nanometers in diameter. And then they're um, also up to 30 microns in length, and they have no cristae, and this allows for the proteins and ions to transfer uh, between the connections. However, this is really rare. It's, um, it's um, not seen very much in um, normal healthy tissue, but then you do see it in disease states. So one of the things that we, when we were doing um, these uh, 3D reconstructions is that we saw a lot of nanotunnels that were present in these samples, and so we decided to quantify how much uh, nanotunnels that were present. And so what we see in the, um, in the three months, one, uh, one year, and two years is that we actually have a lot of nanotunnels. And so um, when we have the most nanotunnels um, in uh, the one-year samples and less in two years, but it was really interesting because I just told you guys that this is only really seen in disease states, but this is normal tissue that we're looking at, and we're seeing a lot of nanotunnels. And so that was a very interesting find. And so one of the second questions that we really wanted to know is like, what is the mechanism causing this fragmentation, right, in uh, these aged skeletal muscle? And so back to my favorite proteins, the Mikos complex. And so again, um, OPA1 is one of the main proteins that's um, important in fusion. And so we know that um, over time, OPA1 decreases, and it's a bonafide um, aging gene. And so we use um, we use OPA1 as our, our positive control throughout uh, this whole talk because we know that it's going to decrease over time. And so we um, actually not uh, looked at three of the um, components of the Mikos complex, uh, mitophilin, CDCDH3, and 6. And what we see is that we see this general trend that they all decrease over time from three months to two years in skeletal muscle, which really gave us um, the confidence to do more work on this. And so what we did was that we actually knocked out um, the Mikos complex individually, uh, either mitophilin, CHCHD3, and 6. And then again, we used OPA1 as, um, as kind of like a positive marker because we know that when you knock out OPA1, we get fragmentation. And so one of the things we see is that... Um, we put this in cell culture in myotubes and individually knock out the mucos complex. And we do see that there's actually a decrease in mitochondria size. And we can actually um, be able to quantify this looking at mitochondria area and um, looking at the number of um, mitochondria, they actually decrease. And then also looking at a circular, um, circularity index, they actually become more round, which is very uh, similar to our results that we're seeing in the aging mice. And then we also wanted to look at um, uh, the Christe morphology, not just the uh, mitochondria. And so, again, these are in the myotubes. When we knock, uh, knock out these Mikos, um, the Mikos, uh, three Mikos complex um, transcripts, we see that there's um, less Christe and uh, the um, less Christe surface area. And the Christe score is just a score to show how healthy the Christe are. And they're actually pretty unhealthy compared to the um, wild type. And so we wanted to also see if um, there is a decrease in oxygen consumption. So we use a seahorse machine to look. And again, um, OPA1 in light blue here is our uh, negative, our positive control because we do know that um, it decreases oxygen consumption. And one of the things that we do see is that um, mitophilin, um, CHCHD3 and 6 all decrease compared to the control. And then we also looked at the um, myotubes and 3D reconstruction. So here in the wild type, comparing the wild type to all the um, OPA1 knockout and the Mikos complex knockout of mitophilin, CHCHD3 and 6, we do see that there's a general trend where there's fragmentation that's occurring. 
And again, we were able to um, th uh, do a 3D reconstruction of this. And what we see is that there is a decrease in volume and a decrease in mitochondrial length. And so just a summary of what uh, I talked about, we have we see that um, fragmentation occurs in aging skeletal muscles. We see that there's a presence of um, nanotunnels that are only really supposed to be um, present in aging tissue, but we see here in normal tissues. And then we see this general trend that the MECOS transcripts are decreased during aging. And we show that um, seahorse of the knockouts of MECOS complex in myotubes decreases oxygen consumption. And we also see that knockout of the MECOS tra uh, transcripts recapitulates uh, fragmentation, suggesting that the MECOS complex may be responsible for this fragmentation. And so some of the future directions and what we really want to do in the lab is what exactly do, um, what we can treat the mitochondria to see if we can refill cristae, and what happens when you knock out or knock down the mycos complex in an animal model. And um, I would like to um, thank the lab. Uh, the, this is everybody in the Hinton lab, but especially uh, Edgar, who was a very, um, um, he, he was very helpful in helping me with the um, analysis of the skeletal muscle and with that, I can take questions. So we have time for questions for Zer. So great talk there. Um, I'm curious because when you choose your animal model, you have different ages. Have you ever tried to look at them longitudinally, whether when you have those tunnels in the one-year-old animals? like, or not, if you can separate them, they would be more vulnerable in their aged, like, time or not? Does it make sense? Uh, you're asking if there's more nanotunnels in one year? Oh, no, like, if there are more nanotunnels in one year, do you think that would make some animals more vulnerable to age-related disorders? Yeah, so... Um, so we actually, so we actually think that the uh, the nanotunnels are connected to mitochondria uh, DNA mutations, and so one of the things that we see is that, um, so again, this is looking at um, adults, right? So this hasn't actually really looked at um, like young, um, like postnatal animals or so. And so one of the things that you're seeing is that you're probably accumulating mutations. And uh, the mutations is actually what's causing, probably most likely causing the nanotunnels to see. And then I think the reason why we don't have as much nanotunnels in the two years is because they're so fragmented that it's very hard for them to actually like form nanotunnels. Go ahead. Yeah, beautiful and tremendous amount of work. Uh, I'm just wondering, different myofiber types are differentially susceptible to aging, type one, type two. Do you ever, do you have, any insight here about whether the mitochondria are similarly affected? With yeah, so th that's one of the reasons why we decided to do um, gas the gastrocnemius tissue is because it's a mixture. With uh, Cereblock facing SEM, we actually can't dis uh, differentiate, distinguish the difference between those different fibers. But if you were to do, um, if you were to do um, a FIP sim, which is focused ion beam SEM, then you can distinguish the difference between those two. There's actually a paper out by Brian Glancy, and he actually um, distinguishes the difference between those fibers in skeletal muscle. And so if you're really interested in that, you should definitely look up that paper because he actually shows, um, he also reconstructs um, mitochondria in 3D and shows the different organization of mitochondria based on different fiber types. That was really beautiful work. Thank you. The M looks lovely. Um, I was just wondering, were the aging studies done in male animals, and could yes. you speculate on potential sex differences? Yeah, so they are. So these are all done in male animals. I think one of the future studies is we really want to look at is actually sex differences. Um, we do have some sex differences in the heart that we're uh, undergoing right now, and looking at the cristae. And if you really look at the cristae in males and females, even though um, it, uh, even though they're the same age, and one is male and one female. Uh, the males, the Chris, they, they look horrible. Like they just look like they're really bad, especially like the two years. But then like in the females, they have like really nice, really pretty Chris day. And so I think it's really interesting. Most of the top, most of the things that I'm showing is in males, but it would be great to see in females. And again, if we were to able to do the study where he was talking about, we're looking at different fiber types. I think we'll get different organization of mitochondria in males and females. 
Yeah, and one of the things I know this is, but the last thing is that when I uh, when I first saw these mitochondria, it blew my mind because I always see them as like these really like uh, bean shaped mitochondria, right? And I always thought the mitochondria always looked like this, like these little bean shaped. But then when I saw them like this, it literally blew my mind. I like was like, these are not mitochondria. Like, what is this? And so like. It took a lot of convincing. I went through like the whole slides and he was like, see, this is a Chris day. And I was like, okay, I'm convinced now because like at first when I saw these, like I literally thought he was messing with me. <laughs> Thank you for that talk. So the next talk will be by China Gray from Brown University, and she will be talking about the role of VISTA in T-cell tolerance um, in respect to sepsis mortality. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me in a discussion of the role that negative checkpoint protein VISTA plays in sepsis. All right. So first, I want to give you all an idea of the big picture or motivation behind my project, which is this massive public health problem of sepsis. The most current definition is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. It's a very common disorder. It costs billions of dollars each year to treat and results in a lot of death. To improve treatment options and methods of diagnosis, it's important to understand what regulates the immune responses that are so severely dysregulated during sepsis progression. To begin the discussion of who's responsible, I first want to refresh some of you on your basic immune biology. So in this cartoon, is the shows the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system. And within each arm are several subtype, uh, excuse me, cell types that play an important role in exacerbating the septic immune dysfunction that we observe. We could spend hours talking about each of these cells, but for the sake of time, I'd like to just point out some of the big players that are relevant to uh, my project. So in the adaptive arm, there are lymphocytes, um, including effector T cells and regulatory T cells, or Tregs. Tregs are of particular interest because their functionality intersects both the innate and adaptive responses during sepsis progression. These cells are regulated in part by cell surface proteins or immune checkpoint proteins. Immune checkpoint proteins have really moved to the forefront of immune-directed therapy. The B7 CD28 superfamily is a small subset of checkpoint proteins, and some of the family members are depicted here in this cartoon. They regulate the activation and suppression of many immune cell types during infection. Because they impact both non-overlapping and redundant pathways and cell types, they can be targeted in specific combinations to um, account for the diverse phenotypes that we observe in septic patients. An ideal candidate for combinatorial blockade or therapy should have distinct spatial temporal roles to limit off-target effects and act as a more directed treatment. A relatively new checkpoint protein that may be an excellent candidate for combinatorial blockade is VISTA. VISTA stands for V-domain immunoglobulin suppressor of T-cell activation, and it's my favorite checkpoint protein. Several groups have put together a nice body of work showing that VISTA plays an important role in regulating the T-cell population to promote peripheral tolerance. And this cartoon just shares uh, some of that work. In blue is the naive T cell that VISTA maintains and stabilizes in the thymus under steady state conditions. The purple cell is the regulatory T cell or Treg that VISTA stabilizes um, in the periphery. And the red cell is the effector uh, T cell or pro-inflammatory cell that VISTA negatively regulates under inflammatory conditions. Based on VISTA's prominent role in Treg bio, or excuse me, T cell biology, and T cell regulation, we wanted to see if VISTA plays a role in the T cell response to septic challenge. So we began by looking at CD4 T cells in mice and CD3 T cells in patients. And we found that in um, septic mice, there's a significant increase in the proportion of VISTA positive T cells, and this is seen in um, critically ill patients as well. We also found in line with previous studies that there's a significant decrease in the T cell population in both septic mice and critically ill patients. 
With these results, we wanted to further explore VISTA's role in the T-cell response to septic challenge, so we created a global VISTA gene-deficient mouse. This is a graph depicting the complex progression of sepsis, and we know that there are distinct changes in the T-cell population shown in this blue box here that contribute to poor outcomes in septic patients, including lineage polarization. And we know, as I previously uh, previously mentioned that VISTA plays a role in lineage polarization. So with this, we hypothesized that VISTA is upregulated on regulatory T cells to confer a survival advantage in early stage sepsis. To test this hypothesis, we set out to determine the expression patterns of VISTA and the role that VISTA plays in sepsis morbidity and mortality. For the first aim, we use the sequel ligation and puncture, or CLP, procedure as a proxy for polymicrobial sepsis. So these mice are anesthetized and undergo a midline laparotomy. Then their cecum, which is analogous to the appendix in humans, is ligated and punctured, and the contents of the cecum are then extruded into the sterile cavity. Um, that acts as the infectious insult. We also use a sham technical control, and these mice undergo the surgery but don't have the cecal manipulation. For our first aim, we focused on the Treg population in the following tissues. So 24 hours following CLP or sham, we harvested these tissues and stained cells with the following antibodies using FOXP3 as the specific Treg marker. In the spleen, we found that there is significant upregulation of VISTA on the CD4 T cell popula uh, Treg population. And this correlates positively with um, an increase in abundance in wild type mice following CLP. Interestingly, in VISTA knockout mice, there is no increase in Treg abundance following CLP or septic challenge. We see the same trend in the intestine where um, VISTA expression correlates with the peripheral Treg population. So to summarize, we found that in wild type mice, there is a correlation between increase in VISTA expression and peripheral Treg abundance. And in VISTA knockout mice, we don't see this characteristic increase in Treg abundance. This led us to ask what these cells look like. What do the VISTA knockout Tregs look like? And to do this, we expanded our flow cytometry panel to include more markers and stratify further the Treg population. In the spleen, we found that the VISTA knockout Tregs upregulate um, some of these suppressive mediators, including FOXP3, CTLA4, and CD25, under steady state and inflammatory conditions. We didn't see this trend in the intestine. However, the results in the spleen suggest there is some sort of compensatory upregulation of these suppressive mediators on Tregs in the knockout mice. To further elucidate the functional relevance of these results, we decided to explore the cytokine profile that's rel um, related to T cell function. And briefly, cytokines are small secreted proteins that play specific roles in orchestrating the immune response. So to look at those cytokines, we harvested the peripheral blood from mice 24 hours following CLP or sham and analyzed the abundance of these cytokines using multiplexing. And here are some of those results. In the VISTA knockout mice, we found that there's higher IL-17F and IL-23 following septic challenge. And both of these cytokines play an important role in um, Th17 function and differentiation. And just a reminder, Th17 cells are those effector pro-inflammatory T cells. So this is the cartoon that I shared with you guys previously. Um, and we found uh, from our data that without VISTA, the Treg response to septic challenge is blunted. There's higher um, abundance of these Th17-related cytokines. And this may skew the T cell population towards a more pro-inflammatory Th17 uh, phenotype. We know that VISTA plays an important role in lineage polarization, and we wanted to explore how this change in the T cell paradigm alters recovery to sepsis. And this brings us to our second aim. We first um, assessed changes in survival following CLP, and we found that the VISTA deficient mice have a significant survival deficit relative to wild type. We also wanted to look at some soluble factors indicating uh, morbidities that are associated with sepsis in septic patients. So we harvested the peripheral blood 24 hours after CLP or sham. 
So in addition to survival, we looked at creatine kinase and blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, to assess kidney damage, and we found no significant difference. We also looked at amylase concentration as a readout for acute pancreatic injury and found no significant difference. However, when we looked at indicators of acute liver injury, such as bilirubin and ALT and AST, we did find um, some indication of acute liver injury in the Vista knockout mice following CLP. In addition to looking at some of these soluble factors and looking at survival, we also wanted to see um, if there was any difference in the sepsis-related cytokine storm or pro-inflammatory cytokines um, in the Vista knockout mice. So again, 24 hours following seal pure sham, we harvested the blood and ran another multiplexing panel. And we see that the Vista knockout mice have higher IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha, and MCP-1 um, following CLP. And these are all cytokines that mediate and contribute to tissue damage in septic uh, mice and patients. So to put these results into a working model, upon septic challenge, we see that there is increased VISTA surface expression on Tregs. And without VISTA expression, we have less Tregs and more of a uh, skew towards a TH17 phenotype. In AIM-2, we also see that loss of VISTA um, promotes increased cytokine storm, acute liver injury, and overall decreased survival. These results uh, led us to ask a, a big question. How much or how important are these Tregs that express VISTA in sepsis? So one way to address this is to ask, would the addition of VISTA expressing Tregs improve survival? For the adoptive transfer experiments, we used a FOXP3 overexpressing GERCAT T cell line that also expresses VISTA. And these are the results, so I'll try and explain this a little bit. Um, the gold line represents VISTA knockout mice that received uh, the control, so just HBSS. Um, the blue line represents VISTA knockout mice that received that GERCAT T cell line, uh, Treg line. And you see that the gold line um, the control mice have a significant survival deficit relative to the wild type. But when the mice receive that GERCAT Treg line, their survival um, approaches wild type levels. So just to um, add to this model, when we used the GERCAT Tregs, we were able to um, answer some questions. So again, loss of VISTA changes uh, lineage dynamics by um, possibly altering the cytokine profile. We were able to show that, and I didn't share these experiments for the sake of time, but in vitro we were also able to see that without VISTA, Treg viability is decreased, as well as the production of Treg-derived cytokines. And we were able to tie the VISTA-expressing Tregs to the survival deficit observed in VISTA knockout mice. So an additional question that we're currently pursuing, and this represents the future direction of my project, is where do the effector cells come in? So to conclude, this is the model that we've put together, and we're really trying to piece together the middle part of this mechanism by investigating some of these cells that are regulated by Tregs. And with that, I'd like to thank all of the members of the IL lab, um, the MCB graduate program, the NIH for funding my research, and I'd like to thank all of you for um, attending, and I'd love to take any questions. Questions for China. <laughs> so I found it on this, um, I found it on Google, obviously, but um, there's this artist who does a lot of cool immunology, like funny cartoons. Um, he posts them to this like, artist um, forum. So yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites to use when I give talks. <laughs> I love it. Hi. I do love your cartoon. Um, I was just uh, wondering if how, how unique is VISTA in its activity? So are other cell surface proteins, when are they also expressed in these situations? And when you knock them down, they, do they also affect their response to, to sepsis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's funny, VISTA was actually one of the other names that VISTA has is the homolog for PD-1. So there's another protein in that family 
that um, VISTA was initially compared to because it does have some similarities. Um, it has some structural similarities with another uh, protein in that family, PDL1, um, and we have knocked those out in our lab um, and looked at them using our model and also um, some other models of infection. What's interesting is they actually have the reverse effect. So when PD-1 is knocked out, there's a survival benefit, and the same thing with PD-L1. Um, several groups, primarily um, Dr. Noel's group, has, who has done a lot of the work on VISTA, characterizing VISTA, has shown that um, there's unique structural characteristics of VISTA, but also the timing when VISTA is activated is a lot earlier than some of these other proteins in response to infection. So it's considered one of the earliest um, acting checkpoint proteins. And I think there might be some developmental differences in the VISTA knockout mice that are contributing to the survival deficit. Hi. <laughs> Can you talk about um, the regulation of that increased VISTA surface level expression? Do you have upregulation of those Treg cells, or is that VISTA um, expression regulation separate? Um, so are, are you asking if the there's um, increased expression within the cell that results in increased surface expression? Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't, I started to look at intracellular VISTA expression. Um, I started to play around with that a little while ago. Um, but uh, we haven't done any uh, experiments to determine if there's an increase in expression at the transcriptional level or possibly just a, an intracellular store of VISTA that's mobilized to the cell surface. So we haven't pieced that together quite yet, but it's a good point. Beautiful talk, China. Um, I just wanted to ask, are there any therapeutic applications of VISTA T cells at this point? Um, not at this point. There are... Um, there is a lot of push towards implementing VISTA blockade in cancer research and cancer therapeutics. Um, it hasn't really been touched in the sepsis world quite yet, but it's, I think just from my research, I could see it being possibly a biomarker because it is upregulated so early on um, versus I think trying to make it into a therapeutic would be a little bit more difficult because we do see loss of VISTA makes survival worse, so. Thank you for that talk. Thank you, everyone. So we have one more talk um, in the series from Alive um, Tanshkin from Northwestern University, and she will be talking about the hippocampal neuron activity, BMP signaling, and antidepressant. Definitely not living on my talk. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, setting this up. Thank you, everyone, for coming coming to listen to my talk. I'm very happy to be able to share my research with you. And as Michelle told, I'm going to be talking about the role of hippocampal neuronal activity and BMP signaling and antidepressant action. Let's start. I'm sure I don't have to talk about how common depression is. And I'm also sure how the COVID pandemic increased the numbers really with a sh like sharp increase in number of the cases and you know, prolonged the depression. We are lucky that we can treat the depression, depressive symptoms with antidepressants. However, one third of the patients do not respond to the antidepressants. And two thirds of these patients respond to antidepressants, but it takes them for the symptoms to get better four to six weeks, which is an important timeline because the longer the response time, the higher the risks, especially the higher the risk for the suicide. And the one of the brain regions that is highly affected by the depression and stress is hippocampus, thanks to Alexis. I don't have to introduce the hippocampus that much, but it is one of the brain regions that, ongoing, that, that gives the birth of neurons throughout the adult life or in, a, in a mammal. So we have all these neurons being formed, especially in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, there is a stage by like, process, and then they just like they're born, they became like immature neurons, they get the mature neuron stage and integrate into the system. And it is very well known that the breast patients has a smaller hippocampus, while the antidepressant, antidepressant 
treatment increases the volume of the hippocampus. And there are so many studies showing that also in, an, in the preclinical models, when you stress a uh, mouse, there's a decreased number of newborn neurons. But all these studies generally looks at the, like they delete all this niche in the dentate gyres and look at the results. And they're generally correlational. So when I started my project, I was like, I want to see whether there's a cell autonomous effect and what is the causality. So I decided to use this like in that time, five years ago, uh, very new technology, chemogenetics technology in a transgenic mass model. And the chemogenetic technology is composed of these mutated or synthetic receptors. And they are actually muscarinic receptors, but because of the mutations, they do not respond back, they respond to acetylcholine anymore. They only respond to this like synthetic drug CNO. So in a mammalian body, we don't have these receptors, HM3DQ, HM4DI, or CNO. These are all the compounds that I introduce into the animal. And once the CNO binds to either one of the receptors, depending on which pathway is activating, either it increases the activity of a neuron or the cell, or decreases the activity of the cell. So I chose this model because I really wanted to affect the like, specific cell population in the dentate gyrus. And luckily, we had a like, Cree-Flux system mouse that we can specifically hit these newborn neurons in the dentate gyrus. I used ASCL1 Cree line, and I you know, like, created a double transgenic line with the DREDs or the HM3DQ or HM3DI mice, and then just let these animals to grow. And then when these neurons were mature enough in the hippocampal circuitry, I manipulated their activity. Yeah. Before starting anything, oh, sorry. If you realize there is this HA tag in here in my receptors, and that is the way I, how I follow up these receptors expression. Before starting anything, of course, I wanted to be sure whether I can insert these receptors into the neurons in, or like newborn neurons in the hippocampus. Um, I injected my tamoxifen, waited for three weeks, and at the end of the three weeks, I did this, uh, staining with these animals, and the HA tag um, is magenta in here, and these neurons that we see HA tag expressing neurons are the ones that are expressing my synthetic receptors. Nuen is a neuronal marker for the dentate gyrus. And my next question was, all these neurons, are they immature neurons? They are mature neurons because dentate gyrus is packed all these good and mature neurons. So I did the staining with the calbindin, which is a mature neuronal marker. And there was a very little uh, co-localization with my HA tag or with my synthetic receptors. And I actually did a different panel of uh, maturity markers because of the time limitation, I didn't put them in here, but mainly 90% of these cells were immature neurons in the hippocampus. Once I was sure that I can use the system, I injected tamoxifen to animals for five days, expressed the red receptors, and then the following three weeks, which is the time, actually, that if you remember that four to six weeks of the timeline that the patients give response to the antidepressants. That's also the timeline when these neurons born, day zero, and integrate into the hippocampal circuitry. So during this time, I treated them with fluoxetine or Prozac, very well-known name, of antidepressants, and, or saline. And while doing this, either I gave them CNO to affect the activity of the neurons, or I gave them vehicle just, you know, for them to live their life happily. And in here, okay, let me move. And then the first thing I wanted to be sure, I'm really affecting the activity of these neurons. In here, when I give the CNO, my goal was to silence the neurons. So in this experiment, I use the silencing thread. The first thing, as you can see, ah, EGR is a, a neuronal activity marker. So this time I use the EGR uh, to be able to see whether those neurons are active first. When I treated them with antidepressants, there was a huge increase in the activity of the neurons. And the, if you can see the co-localization with the magenta, so increased activity in those immature neurons I wanted to target. And when I gave CNO to animals, this activity was gone. And I repeated, I saw the same thing in my vehicle group too. 
then I was like, okay, that's a good, amazing molecular phenotype. So how can I also look at the behavioral phenotype, whether I'm changing anything when I do this to animals? I ran multiple tests, but I'm only going to be talking one test because of the time limitation. Tail suspension test. A tail suspension test is a very widely used test to be able to evaluate the effects of antidepressants. It is not, it's very, very widely used. It's not that accepted anymore, but in the paper I have more behavior. But this one is the easiest one to like see the result. So what we are doing in here is we are just suspending the animal from the tail, and the animal might just stay immobile, which means just give up. Or the animal just like struggle, just like really not happy in that situation. The animal wants to be free. And depending on this like two modes, we can identify the depression-like state of the animal. If they're giving up easily, they are showing more depression-like behavior. If they're still struggling, so they're not showing that learned helplessness. And in my group, first, I would like you to pay attention to this white bar, which is my actual control animals. And in the y-axis, we are seeing the immobility. So the higher the immobility, the more depressed animals. And when we give animals the fluoxetine, the control condition, we saw that there was a decrease in immobility. So fluoxetine was doing what it's supposed to do. But whenever we silence these neurons, which means like this condition where my magenta cells were not that active, in both conditions, either in control or fluoxetine conditions, we reversed the phenotype. So the antidepressant was not working anymore. And then we concluded, yes, like when we uh, stopped the activity of these neurons, we were causing a behavioral deficit, prevent anti antidepressant effect, and there was no change in the number of those newborn neurons. And Prozac is a like first-line antidepressant, very well known, very widely used. So we asked the, the way that we can replicate these results with a very new drug, which is ketamine, just approved by FDA in 2009, very rapid acting antidepressant. You give one dose, and then you see the effects within two hours that sustains for weeks. So we repeated a very similar experiment, not a chronic inhibition, but this time one dose inhibition because of the fast acting effect of the ketamine, and we replicated the same data. You can see in the ketamine condition, we see the ketamine effect in here, but when we silence those neurons, the effect of the ketamine was gone. And these results showed us to be able to have the antidepressant effect, we need, the, we need those newborn neurons. The activity of those newborn neurons are necessary to be able to see the antidepressant effect. Our next question was whether they're sufficient whether we can just, because we saw there was no change in the number of those neurons. And we were like, oh, what if we just affect their activity? Can we see an antidepressant effect? So we went ahead before moving all of these. We did the experiments in wild type animals. Yeah, we saw an antidepressant effect, but it was not a depression model. So we wanted to see whether we can do the same thing in a depression model. And I'm sure I, this time I expressed this activator, like excitatory dread in these animals, in, in mature neurons. Gave the tamoxifen for five days to express the neurons. And here is our three week timeline. We use an unpredictable chronic mild stress paradigm. And I'm sure I don't have to talk about how stress and depression goes hand in hand. And at the end of this like three weeks, our animals were showing depressive like behavior. Then what we did, we had the three groups, saline, ketamine, and CNO. This time, CNO is going to increase the activity of the neurons, that those immature neurons in the dentate gyrus. And we already know ketamine is increasing the activity of those neurons. We just wanted to have an internal control, too. And after injecting these the compounds, 24 hours later, we look at the behavior. But before behavior, we wanted to be sure we are increasing the activity of those immature neurons in the dentate gyrus. And in here, our CNO condition, uh, you can see EGR1, the neuronal activity marker. This time, our HA tag, which shows the expression of our synthetic receptors, are green. And there was an increase in CNO condition. There was an increase in ketamine condition. Salient animals were just salient animals. There was like some increase, like not some increase, some activity in there, but it was so hard to see. 
Next, we looked in different behavior, but I'm gonna, again, talk, gonna talk about the tail suspension test. What happened is, again, we look at the immobility of these animals. The higher the immobility, more depressed they are. And when we compare the ketamine and CNO animals with the saline animals, uh, there was a decrease in the like immobility, which means that activation of those immature neurons induces a rapid antidepressant effect. It was mimicking the antidepressant of the ketamine and without affecting the number of these neurons. So eventually, these two experiments showed us the activity of those immature neurons are both necessary and sufficient for the antidepressant effect. But it didn't still answer my question of like, because antidepressants, like all class of antidepressants, increases the number of those immature neurons in the hippocampus. And I was just like, that could be a summation effect. You know, more neurons, more activity. And, but is there a common pathway? I really wanted to answer this question. And we moved ahead with the pathway that we were already familiar in my lab, bone morphogenic protein signaling. And there is a negative relationship between neurogenesis and BMP signaling. The higher the BMP signaling, lower the neurogenesis. Or when we make animals run, you know, eat healthy diet, and increase the neurogenesis, then the BMP signaling goes down. And I really wanted to see whether all of these antidepressants are also affecting the BMP signaling as they're affecting the neurogenesis. Because I'm out of time. When we keep the BMP signaling high, none of those antidepressants work. We did the transgenic animals. We did the viral overexpression. We did the cell-specific overexpression. And we couldn't make the BMP signaling go down with any one of those antidepressants. And at the same time, like the any one of those antidepressants in the list, I'm just showing fluoxetine here, did not work. They were as if like they were not working. So in conclusion, in these three different studies, we show that there's a specific population of cells in the dentate gyrus in which neurons, and their activity is both necessary and sufficient for antidepressant effect. And BMP signaling can be a mediator of multiple class of antidepressants by increasing the immature neurons in the adult brain. And I want to thank to my lab, my advisors, Dr. Kessler and Dr. Peng, my collaborators, my funding resources. And I can take the questions now. That was a really great presentation. And I have a thousand questions, but I'll only ask one and catch up with you later. Okay. Um, I've been out of the neurogenesis field for a while, but one of the recurring questions, and you mentioned this when you uh, said that you were doing a, trying to determine whether the effect was cell autonomous. Mm -hmm. The new neurons have a lower threshold for firing. Yes. They're uh, young and excitable. Yes. Um, and it's possible that they could be producing something, a neurotrophic factor, that impacts activity of the surrounding mature neuronal mm -hmm. population. Did you quantify uh, EGR1 in the mature neuronal population after silencing or activating the immature neuron population? Yes, but I did not do the EGR1 because when I, was doing all, when I was doing all these studies, I realized EGR1 was more readily activated by immature neurons. I did the CFOS for the mature neurons. And like, yes, there was an increase, like in a total also increase in the activity of the dentate gyrus more for both mature and immature neurons together. Yeah. I did all the quantifications, but I couldn't put them in here. Yeah. <laughs> but we can talk about it. Hi. Fantastic talk, and I learned so much about this. So I was just curious. So I know clozapine is um, its not our first line when it comes to antidepressants. So I was just wondering why you were using CNO specifically. Oh, when I was doing these experiments, unfortunately, there were no other uh, ligands for these like red receptors, CNO was the only one. And then when I submitted my grant, actually the science paper came and said CNO can be converted back to clozapine. But then I repeated these experiments with DCZ. I still saw the same results, but the main reason that was the only ligand at that time. Yeah. Thank you for that great talk. I was wondering about the reversibility of the effect of these antidepressant agents. Have you looked to see if 
taking away these uh, agents would reverse the pattern of increased proliferation of the yeah. immature neurons? Uh, we are running those experiments now, actually. We just finished collecting the data last week, so hopefully I will be talking about them soon. Thank you for that great talk. Thank you. So thank you for attending this session. We have a five minute break and then we will have a panel on the pandemic perspectives, which is fitting considering we just talked about depression. <laughs>